This is Eugene Hernandez from the Film Society of Lincoln Center. Today for the New York Foundation for the Arts, talking with Yancey Ford about developing audiences. What they spent time on was investigating his background. That's what they spent time on. Day by day, you hear that your son is being investigated. Day by day, you hear rumors. And you grow more and more afraid. You've been working with filmmakers for so much of your career, empowering, nurturing, and supporting filmmakers to tell their own stories. To what extent have you been discussing the notion of audience with them? And how did those conversations influence your own decisions sure. with regard to Strong Island? You know, the, the work that I did at POV um, for 10 years, and even after I left POV and continuing to just be a part of the doc community in New York, what I had been advising people was, was very specific to the time. I admitted freely that I didn't know anything about audience development the way that it's done now, which is exclusively via these apps. I would not have thought that Strong Island needed to be on Instagram and on Twitter, and not so much on Facebook. Directors need to have someone who is building audience from the beginning and to share behind the scenes images or to tease what the film was about and to really start building audience from the first day of shooting. People want to be involved and it's difficult because I think that as filmmakers our instinct is to protect our process and to protect this baby of our film, right, and to not have us distracted. But the truth is that if you finish your film and then look to build your audience, it's too late. I would love to know a little bit more then about those conversations you had with your team about those early stages of audience development. Were you reluctant? How did you overcome that reluctance if you were? Mm -hmm. How did you navigate that? I was really reluctant because part of it was that it's a very serious subject and I think that I had to accept that as a director, people would want to know about me. And I had to accept that who the author of the work is, is of interest to, to the audience. Audiences are so sophisticated and I think it's a good thing, and that's something that we have always said, don't underestimate your audience, right? Audiences are so sophisticated that not only do they not want to be underestimated, they want in on the process. They want to know what it takes to make a film, mm -hmm. right? They want to be as invested in the process as you are, and they want to be invested in you as a, as, as a director that they aren't just going to engage with once, but a director whose career they're going to follow. Once I sort of got over my, you know, my hesitation to, to, to point the camera at myself and just share my random thoughts, it turned out that people appreciated my sense of humor. People just appreciated hearing from me. And I would never have thought that that would be a part of drawing people to the film. But I think that's partly how you build trust with your audiences. How do you know where the barrier is or the boundary is? How do you find that point that isn't too far? Yeah. Or do you find it by going too far and pulling back? I mean, how do you? Right, well, there's, there's very little chance of getting it wrong. Um, the, only th the only thing that you can get wrong about using social media to build audience is not doing it. I didn't know anything about influencers. Solange watched Strong Island. And I know that she watched it because she took, the, she took a screen grab and she must have been watching it on her phone, which also made me incredibly happy. And incredibly conflicted, but still incredibly happy. She took one of the final images of Strong Island and turned it from a vertical image to a horizontal image and actually wrote Strong Island by Nancy Ford and put it in her Insta story. And I woke up on Saturday morning and I literally had a phone full of text messages and I was like, what is happening? The impact of that, right, of the impact of one person, of one influencer, when it worked the first time, I was like, oh, that's what this whole thing is about. It's all about influencers. And I have to just sort of accept that getting influencers sort of plugged into Strong Island and then, you know, via those influencers, getting all of those folks plugged into Strong Island, that, that's a good thing. When I said yes to that, I, 
I mean, I think Solange is actually what tipped me. Like, she's, she's, what, she's what pushed me over the edge. As soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, I'm in. I will do whatever you tell me to do. In your case, you've made a documentary. You've taken it out into the world. But then you're basically making another documentary <laughs> about taking it out into the world. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's, it gets to be so meta, but there is a point to the documentation of the rollout, the documenting of the festival run and all of those Q&As and putting that content online provides a richer experience for the audience in the theater because then they go on to social media after they've been at a screening to talk about their experience of the film and they find that other people have already been talking about their experience even though they've seen it in a different place and there gets to be this conversation between two audiences that have seen the film in two completely separate places but that they're interacting with one another and they're interacting with you because then you jump onto social media and you continue the conversation. Essentially, it's like a snowball, right? You're picking up new audience members as you're going along without losing old ones. I never thought that, you know, being at a film festival or doing a Q&A or going from one festival to another would be interesting material. But I think it's really important to make sure that you have people in the theater taking, you know, video of your Q&As. It's really important that you have people live tweeting. All of that becomes part of the material that you use to build audience. It becomes what they, it becomes what the audience can feed off of until they can see the film. It creates a record of your rollout. And it also gives, you know, audiences who may not discover the film until a year after you've released it, right? It gives them an entire span of material to engage with so that they can learn about the film, they can learn about you, and they can learn about your team. And I'm curious to know, in the case of this film, how the kinds of conversations you were having in a theater at a festival, for example, yeah. versus the kind of conversation you're having over social media when someone has watched the film alone or with a couple of people mm -hmm. in their own home. Mm -hmm. The kinds of questions, the kind of engagement and interaction, how it felt different to you in sure. those two environments. Of course. Well, because Strong Island is so charged, there's a lot of the feel to the questions that are very similar on social media and in person at festivals and screenings. But when people are in the room with you, they try to keep their questions on point. Social media, on the other hand, um, is an exercise in how to ignore stupid questions or how to ignore deliberately provocative questions. I engage with the people who have serious questions. And I, I just generally ignore the ones who are looking to have a, an argument about whether or not racism is real. I, I don't go down that path, and I think that that's been a really good strategy for this film. Well, I'm wondering, on the other end of that spectrum, to what extent you found, in your own experience, social media as also a safe space. Someone who might not be able to, or comfortable with, yeah. or willing to stand up in a theater, yeah. but they're able to express something, share something, ask something, engage you in a way yeah. that you never would have had the opportunity to do yeah. in a live environment. I heard from uh, a young man uh, who was a foster child in the neighborhood where I grew up, who was mentored by my mother in the later years of her life. She, was, she remained very active in our community right up until um, you know, her passing. And he had gone to college, he had, you know, graduated. He'd been encouraged by my mother to take his education seriously and also not to apologize for wanting a quality education. And he saw the film on Netflix and hadn't realized that my mother had died. And reached out to me via social media to explain how positive an impact she'd had on his life. And I think that because he knew he was sending a message directly to me, that he was able to be sort of vulnerable and honest um, about how hurt he was and how angry he was at his foster mother. She hadn't told him that my mother had passed away. He was able to say thank you for allowing him a moment of closure. So the film premieres at Sundance. As the year's coming to an end, people are putting the film on their 10 best lists and it's getting nominated for awards and there's all this attention that starts to build. Right. So I wonder how you perceived and saw and experienced the audience for your film changing mm -hmm. as it starts to reach a different audience. Mm -hmm. How did that change not only 
your relation to the audience, but the kinds of engagement you were having, whether that be at live events, screenings, yeah. festivals, uh, events around you know New right. York and L.A., right. but also online. You know, so two things happened when the film was nominated for an Oscar. Um, an incredible thing happened to a first-time director with their first film. You know, granted my you know my experience at POV and being a programmer and you know my background in the arts notwithstanding, this was still my first film. So it got written about a lot because of that. It also got written about a lot because apparently I'm the first openly transgender director to be nominated for an Academy Award. The transgender aspect of my story was what propelled us into the headlines for the first time. And so it all of a sudden went from, okay, are we on the short list to holy moly, we're nominated. And then literally the same day was first transgender director, boom, 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 boom. And, and online, people came out of the woodwork and they were like, thank you for being visible. Thank you for being an example. Thank you for not apologizing for who you are. I just, I got a lot of thank yous via social media. In person, at the screenings that happened after the nomination, I think people were kind of curious to see like what all the fuss was about, right? And I'm an Aries. I'm kind of fiery and, and stubborn, and I really enjoy engaging in debate. And so I would have a lot of people ask me about the trans aspect of the nomination and whether or not they thought I was nominated because I was transgender and it was this moment of me too and wanting to be inclusive. And I think that some people went into the screenings with that assumption. And then after they saw the film, I think it proved to them on a certain level that there was merit there. That moment when you're making the decision about how to take the film out into the world, yep. um, weighing yep. what some might call a more traditional release, whatever that means today, right. against something that's a bit different, mm -hmm. going in a different direction, and how working with Netflix specifically could mm -hmm. help you get to the audience you were hoping to get to with this film? I went into Sundance with the best case scenario for me being a theatrical distributor picking up the film, um, having a theatrical run, qualifying for the Academy, um, and then going to you know US broadcast. Having gone into the festival with that very traditional model in mind, the thing that was happening that I was actually surprised at was that no one was interested in picking up the film. I didn't get any theatrical distributors who were interested in Strong Island, which really is a sobering thing. And for me, I was like, oh. And then when Netflix saw the film and they said, we'd like to talk to you about Strong Island, it both presented a scenario that no one could have imagined, right? No one could have imagined 100 plus countries. No one could have imagined an uncounted number of subscribers. But no one, could, no one also could have imagined letting the film go for the sake of the larger public. But I think at the end of the day, um, everyone recognized that the reach of Netflix and the importance of the film getting that broad of a, of a footprint was perhaps more important. And when all of our partners sort of aligned with that decision, the effect was immediate. When Netflix went to see the film at Sundance, we had the potential for a global footprint, which no one had anticipated. And that really required a lot of introspection on the part of everyone involved in the film. It was like, okay, are, are we going to take a chance? This new idea of where audiences can be found, right? While still maintaining the co-production status with, with our public partners. And so everybody got on board. It was kind of a miracle, but everybody got on board. And I think it's because of the multiplying effect of streaming that Strong Island wound up a nominee for the Academy Award. And it has borne out that there are people who are looking for content in places where traditional content providers don't yet have a strong enough foothold or a unique enough brand. Another word that I've learned to use when thinking about audience, like how do you brand your film? How do you brand yourself? And how do you use that branding to attract people to, uh, to your film? It's been an incredible learning experience. <laughs>